Camp Pros, and welcome to the Camp Hacker Podcast. My name is Travis Allison. I run the Summer Camp Professionals Group on Facebook, and Go Camp Pro, and CampMavericks.com. Hi, my name is Dan Weir. I have over 20 years of experience working in camping, uh, primarily with overnight and day camping with the YMCA, and I currently work for the YMCA of Long Island and consulting with their five day camps. And my name's Joe Richards. I'm the executive director at Pierce Williams Summer Camp and Retreat Facility in Southwestern Ontario. We're a United Church of Canada affiliated facility, and I've been here for the past 15 years, and, and we're located about halfway between Detroit and Toronto. My name is Ruby Compton, and I'm the Chief Exploration Officer for Ruby Outdoors, which basically just means I'm a freelance camp professional. And I also am the Master Class Provost for uh, Go Camp Pro, as well as one of the co-hosts of the podcast, Camp Code. That's awesome. We're so grateful that you're here, Ruby. Thanks for coming in on this conversation. Um, you should definitely check out Ruby Outdoors. They have a really cool program for taking camp pros, camp pro specific, Ruby, Indeed. way to the woods. Indeed, yeah, we're, we're playing in the woods and, and doing a, a professional development opportunity there as well. So come heal and play and learn in my mountains. In the North Carolina, it'll be beautiful. Mm -hmm. What an awesome idea. So great, grateful that you're back again, Ruby. And uh, Ruby also, sometimes Ruby's resume with Go Camp Pro is hard to fit all in, but I should also acknowledge that she's one of the co-hosts of, of Camp Code, and that is a huge contribution to the camp community. If you're not a Camp Code listener and you do any staff training or staff training planning, you need to be listening to Camp Code. So welcome back, Ruby. Today we are talking about setting expectations for staff. I think that this is something that all camp pros would acknowledge is important, and most camp pros are kind of crap yet. And so we wanted to talk really specifically uh, about this, that there is value in setting those expectations, setting them high enough, and then supporting people to get to, to those expectations. I know from our experience camp directing that we had very high expectations of staff that sometimes if people were new to our camp community, it was very hard for them to go from one camp experience and then come to us where we had much different camp expectations of our staff. But I think that having such great expectations, high expectations of our staff meant that we had a much better program than the camps. Those staff would acknowledge we had a much better program than those, those programs that they came from. So part of that, I think, is just the example you set, but I think it's important for us to address really explicitly setting expectations. And so, Ruby, I wonder for you, what are the sort of things that you think camps should be doing or that you've done when you've been directing that helps staff just plainly understand this is, we expect a lot of you. For sure. Uh, well, as m we've talked about a lot on Camp Code, and I'm sure here on this podcast as well, that you know, hiring or hiring and um, folks going through your application process is part of training too. And so, in my best boss ever class, one of the things that I have my students do is actually really map out expectations about the hiring process. Uh, it should be so clear on your website that you know this is how long it takes to fill out an application. This is about how long you can expect to hear back from us, knowing that at certain parts of the year that might change, right? In January, you may hear back right away. In May, you may not, uh, depending on how your application process, or it might be flip-flopped, <laughs> depending on how your process is going. Um, and then talking about, you know, how many interviews are there potentially gonna be? Uh, is there any sort of creative or written work? Uh, and then what does a job offer look like? What are your expectations if they have other job offers that they're considering? These are all things that I think need to be outlined on your website. Um, some of that reinforced in the interview and very, very clearly laid out. I think part of that is that we have a lot of folks who are applying for jobs for the first time. So they really don't have any idea exactly what this process looks yes. like. Yes, yes, um, yes. But the second piece is that that shows that we take this seriously and it is there is a, a process that we are following and that we hold to our word, right? So if you say you're going to um, be in touch in two weeks, you better touch base in two weeks. Even if you don't have a job offer necessarily to offer, it's okay to say, hey, we're still reviewing your application. Uh, and I recently went through an application process for a part-time guiding service and um, was really 
really, really impressed with the fact that they sent me newsletters. They clearly had an email newsletter or sequence set up for their applicants. So while their applicants were sitting in that holding, waiting to hear back, they're reviewing, they had this brilliant right. newsletter that came yeah. out that talked about, you know, this is what you could expect for it to work for us full time. This is the kind of trips we have going on during the winter time. Our big season is summer, but if you work for us in the winter, it's really helpful if you're a Spanish speaker, right? So right there, they had that much more time. They were putting in um, uh, expectations. And uh, I, I just thought it was brilliant. And I got one of those about once a week. And it was clear that, you know, somebody was actually working on those in real time because that, that was happening over the holidays. So they had some text that was related to, you know, well, it's I'm so excited about the winter holidays and this is what we're doing. Um, so I think you could write a lot of that ahead, ahead of time, but I just thought that was smart, smart, smart. And I think camps that jump on that are going to see some retention and see their applicant pool be a little more committed too. Well, I think maybe that, um, that's something that Dan has said before, like this is stuff you work on in September. Like get all this stuff organized. And um, it sounds like a lot of that could easily have been automated that they just plunk in, tag Ruby's email, plunk Ruby's email into a sequence and totally. they get it. But they're obviously tuning it seasonally. Mm -hmm. So totally. automate it and spend the five minutes to personalize and or change it according to scenes. Mm -hmm. So Dan, what do you think should be happening in the fall? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I think uh, when I reflect on my own career that my first several years of working as a director, I did not use the fall effectively. I, in my brain, had to have a respite because of the amount of hours I put in. And once I kind of cleared that mental hurdle in my brain and started realizing that, like, the fall was really for the deep work, fall was for really setting up automation, you know? So if you don't know how to, like, automate your system, like, fall is when you spend a day and you dive in and try and figure it out. Yeah, and uh, and so if you're using that um, with the goal of clearing expectations, I, I think that that's huge. The, the biggest thing I've noticed with staff as a whole kind of pivoting to this topic um, is that the, the staff really are have two conflicting thoughts. One is that they want to explicitly be told what to do and when to do it. And then the other is they want to be heard. And camp directors that have been working for a while, if they haven't figured out this duality, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they get punched in the face by one, <laughs> they, 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 if not both, you know, like and it's friction and it's a lot, you know, but there's a way to make people feel validated and heard and make people also explicitly be told. So like, you know, Ruby's example just now, like getting email newsletters, perfect. Like you're telling them what's going on with the organization. You're making them feel heard because they're feeling informed about the process. Like it's not that complicated and i just you know like uh, the employers that don't do this are are, are the ones that aren't filling you know like uh, like it, it, when you do this properly you get double the amount of applicants you need you know so like it just doesn't and if you haven't um if you haven't done this right pretend like you're 16 17 and just go apply to a bunch of jobs and see how nobody gets back to you ever and you get discouraged so like the it, it's they're growing up in a world of constant communication and they're not being hear, heard back from. Uh, and that's why you're getting this, this dropout rate. That's why you're getting people not reply to people. Uh, it's because what it's how they're being treated and it's, it's symptoms society, but like you, you could rise to it just by doing some simple communication. Yeah. I think Sorry. that what Dan said yeah. is, I think the, the idea of I have a 16 and a 15, a 17 or 15 year old in my house who are applying for jobs and they can go months in between hearing once they've applied, but they're also afraid to, to reach out, right? If you're the candidate that applies and then reaches out a week later with a phone call and reaches out every week with a phone call, somebody eventually is going to get back to you. And, and we've trained our kids to do that so that they get on the noticed pile or the annoying pile, whichever one you want to see, um, but I think that a lot of this, this, this topic, a lot of it was covered in a wide variety of sessions at ACA National. And that's why I suggested it, because there were a ton of people who were talking about expectations and, and where we set them. So whether we set them in hiring. Uh, so from a hiring perspective, my, my one note from the, the ACA National was that I think we do too soft of a sell on our job. Like when I put a job description out. So when I'm advertising the job, you know, one of the taglines that is currently being used by our staff is best 
summer ever. And I'm, I'm more inclined to go with the, this is going to be your hardest summer ever, right? Like challenge them before they even apply to know what they're getting into. Um, and, and really sell, set those expectations right at the beginning with our staff, because as Travis said, if you have high expectations, um, the reason we set high expectations is because we believe people can meet them, right? And we, we, we have confidence in them. And I think that's the other thing that we don't always share with our staff is that the reason we set them high is because we believe in them. The, the, one of the keynotes used the phrase, I'm giving you these comments because we have high standards and I know you can exceed them, right? And don't say that if they can't exceed them because there are some, some people who simply can't, but it's a, it's a fascinating, it's fascinating to watch people um, talk about the fact that we're as camping professionals are being ghosted by applicants a lot more now than we've ever been in the past. We now have a phrase for it. When it used to happen to me, I was just pissed off. But then I realized um, you shouldn't, I shouldn't give any of my energy to someone who, who quits on me or who doesn't reply back, right? Because that's just a waste of my time. And I only have so much energy in the day and I don't need to be pissed at you. I'm just going to go on living my life shame free. That's how I'm going to live my life. And so um, with those expectations, setting them right at the beginning helps for when they come into staff training later on. Yeah, 100%. I, I think we should make 100% note, and this will be in the show notes at campacro.tv slash podcast. This is episode 124, I believe. But you'll know by the title. Anyway, go to the show notes. Look at the pre-interview booklet that Gab puts out at Waro that is stunning. Like it's, it's Gab's work, so it's incredibly well designed, but they've just been so thoughtful and at setting up the expectations. That's how long an interview will go. Here's what you do to prepare. Here's when you can, like it's all of those things Ruby very specifically said about the hiring process that Waro has completely laid it out. So find those in the show notes and download it. It'll be the seventh or eighth time we've mentioned it on Camp Hacker. Um, but if you're new to us now, then look for episode 124 and, and uh, find that there. Um, it's just so well done let, laying out the journey of what it means to be an applicant. So that's such a cool, cool part of it. Uh, so that's that. That's good in the, the early part of the hiring process and getting yourself ready. Is there stuff at the actual interviews about expectations? I think, um, I, Joe, I, I want you to say the line, but you say it all the time. It's a big part of the show about your expectations of what staff are going to be called on to do. So I hope you do say that. I hope you open, I hope you open with that, Joe. But um, what are other things that you do in interviews or hiring that um, help set your expectations? So we, we start by giving them, um, before they enter, sometimes sitting out on the desk, we don't, I'm not sure how much we do it because I don't do our interviews right now, but we have a staff expectation sheet. And this is something I got from Camp Robin Hood like 15 to 20 years ago. So that's Howie, who's part of another podcast of ours. And, and essentially the staff expectations goes over everything we expect from time commitment, right? Like tr staff training, uh, here's your daily responsibilities here. And it's all on one sheet. It's a, it's a graphically designed sheet because it's hard to fit all that stuff into a Word document. Um, but it starts with that, that our job description, which is to do what needs to be done, right? So it, it starts with that and it goes down to everything and dates and whatnot. And then we have them sign it. And then we keep a copy and they take a copy home. And we, if, they're, if they're under 18, we have them take it home and have their parents sign it as well because we need their parents to know what they're committing to. Um, and I think that uh, one of the, Dr. G said in her session, um, the idea of a communication contract with interviewees, right? That you talk to them about, okay, great. Here's how we're gonna communicate going forward. The expectations that we set in ours, um, years ago, I figured out that if you are not going to give me, have your references in before I interview you, I'm not going to interview you. It's just because if um, we put it on them to get the references, we give them a, 
uh, link to a document and then the references can can fill it out and get it back. But I just don't interview you unless you you've taken those, all of those steps. And I so I am putting the onus on you, but the people who do it are the people who are going to be better staff members because they want to be um, they want to be a staff. And if you interview someone and then you're like, well, can you get your two references to fill these out? And then it goes months, right? Like how often do you follow up with someone? Yeah. Um, you've already wasted your time um, by interviewing them if they suck in that way. So I think those are a lot of the, inter- the, the expectations we have right in that moment. How about for you, Dan? This topic of hiring is very funny. You know, I think it's important to remember that our young staff are not working for us for money. I mean, they, they want the money. That is important. They don't, the um, money to them is also a sign of respect, but they're working for us um, uh, for experience. And I think when you look at people wanting to work for somebody, they want to work for somebody that they're going to learn from. And uh, you learn best when you feel respected. So if you don't have a respectful hiring process, um, and you can help them the high standards. Everything everyone's been saying so far is being respectful. Um, but if you don't aren't respectful in your communication, uh, you know the, you're setting the tone that you're not going to be respecting the staff the same way you respect other people when they when they come to you with issues. So I just think as a whole, we really need to drill that in. And then um, uh, once you've got them hired or they know you you like each other. I think as transparent, being as transparent as possible, not only about the hiring process, but about what it's like to work at your place, um, it's just key. I I think, you know, like too many people uh, get bamboozled, for lack of better words, right? So like they they think one thing and they get there and it's another thing. So I, when I was hiring at at, um, this camp in the Catskills, I would try to deter people from thinking it was gonna be this glamorous, time and and exactly what joe was saying about hard but i would also say like look we're an hour away from the mall we are not in cell service getting on wi-fi is a a big deal know that i'll do everything i can to take care of you but just want to let you know like this is what you're in for so they can start building that mental model and i and if we're looking at you they have such anxiety about what they don't know so um while you feel like that might be scaring them off that actually is helping them be making a well-informed decision. And I've never had anyone not come to camp because of cell service. So like, it, like I think it's important to just be very upfront and be very respectful in your process. Um, and then to start building excitement right away um, to really pivot to, um, we, we need you here. You're part of a movement using more grand language than just you're doing a job and you get paid. Right. Yeah. Um, that it goes back to this fundamental. They don't, you know, they, they care about money in terms of respect and they of course want money, but their, their chief reason is for experience is why they're doing it. It might be the best summer ever, or it might be, you're going to grow so much, or it might be, you want to work with children, but just, it, it goes back. And that's, that's always been there, but it's more prominent than ever before. Yeah. And I want to echo on to what you said, Dan. So as I've been launching my own business, I've been working some, you know, side hustles and, and server jobs. And let me tell you, working in an environment where everybody's just working for money, it's really clear. It is really, really clear. <laughs> so uh, I would agree that, you know, for all the talk there is about raising wages and, and how we do that. And, and, you know, yes, we need to pay our staff better if we can and recognize that a camp job is, much more than just there for the paycheck. So um, just wanted to put that little tidbit in. Uh, and, and I also like can't say enough that idea of, you know, if we scare people off there, they shouldn't be working for us. Um, and, and in my pre-interview document that I sent out, uh, I outlined for resident camp, you know, you are serving in loco parentis, you will clean up pee, poop, vomit, bodily fluids, if that is something that you're not willing to do, then you, you can't work here. Um, and I thought I was going to get a lot more questions about that. And I didn't. And I think I was ready for the, you know, when somebody is like, is that really something we have to do? I was going to be like, yeah, and we're the camp that tells you about it. <laughs> you know, all the other camps, you're going to have to do it, but they're just not telling you about it. So just want to be really clear about that. Uh, but I had nobody who ever really asked me about that. Um, and I think the folks that read that and said, Ugh, this is not for me, they didn't continue with the application process. Um, and it was a lot easier when, you know, you had a counselor come in and go, there's poop on the walls. And you're like, great, <laughs> let's clean it up. And they just, they just did. They just jumped into action. Um, I, so two other just little notes that I want to throw in about expectations during the interview process. 
One is that, uh, and you have to be careful legally about this, but I used to ask pretty explicitly during the interview if kind of where we fell in their priority of other opportunities they were looking at for the summer. So, and we specifically mentioned like internships or travel. Are there things that you are waiting to hear back on uh, or that take a higher priority? If you get them, you're going to go do that. And especially with return staff, because we tend to lose folks to internships. And the reasoning that I gave them was, we just need to know kind of what your priority level is with us and what your timeline is. So if you know you're not going to be able to give us a decision until March, cool. Like as long as we're on the same page with that, if you're transparent with us, I'll be transparent with you. If you get to February and you need an answer because this other opportunity comes up and you really want to weigh the two, then I can tell you in February what our decision is at that point. That decision may be different in April or in January, but if that's when you need a decision by, then let's talk about it. But I, I always tried to put in some language to invite that conversation. Um, and again, just be careful about the HR piece of like, we're really not supposed to be asking about other jobs that folks are applying for. So you need to be careful about that, uh, but welcoming them to share some, some information about kind of where you are on the priority list and, and um, how, how we can both be transparent and accommodate each other. And I love that because you're setting the expectation that they are going to communicate with you as well as you're leading by example, but you're also explicitly saying we need you to communicate to mm -hmm. us about these kind of things. And on top of our staff expectations, there's just a little paragraph that is literally, if you've accepted or committed to somewhere else, we cannot interview you. You need to deal with a, a camp specifically because there's a code in the Ontario Camps Association like a code of conduct. So if you've committed to another camp, we're saying right there in writing, you need to deal with them, right? Before you interview with us, the same way as if you commit to us, you're committing to us. And so it, it's just, we put it clearly and that was taken right from Robin Hood when I got that years ago. I, I just want to clarify something I said earlier, you know, um, uh, I'm not trying to say that people should be leveraging experience the, the experience of working at Camp Over Money. Um, I, I think it's really important that we are paying wages that are competitive and that we are staying relevant. I'm just saying it's not the top motivating factor for most of our staff. Uh, that's an extremely privileged point of view to say. It. It's just that my experience is that if they want to earn money elsewhere, they'll, if they want to earn more money, they'll work elsewhere. That's all. So, Yeah, agreed on that. So let me, let me also get into that in a small bit, Dan, and say, from a communication standpoint, if you're going to, to be the best communicating potential job that they've ever worked at, and then when they get hired, the best communicating job they ever work at, um, some of that means doing things like asking your 2019 staff at the end of the summer, like, what do you get out of this so that you can communicate? Here are the other benefits that people in your position have got from this camp experience. Because if it's their first job or the, even they've grown up at campers and they just, they just want to keep their camp career going, but they haven't really thought about what it means to change sides in the camp equation, then they need some language and or they're competing with with internships, et cetera. They need the language from the stuff that Kim Acox done with Project Real Job and the ACA, but also just from people their own age at your camp, here are the things. Like that's a great thing to have ready to go to say, here are all the benefits I got from stuff. And Ruby, you had uh, you said you had two points. You had something yeah, else. Yeah, just one other that I I recently heard something that kind of blew my mind, and that was I interviewed Dan Davis, who's a longtime camp director with Camp Rockmont, in Western North Carolina. And so on our Camp Code episode sixty three, I did an interview with him. Loved it. Loved he, it. Loved it. Oh, good. I'm so glad. So one of the things he said that I was just like, oh my gosh, that is so incredible. And your commitment to youth development is amazing. Is he said that he has had do-overs in interviews where if he meets somebody and they try to do most of their interviews in person when they can, that he will, if it's just not going well, if they're not being um, open and kind of vulnerable and, and sharing what they need to, and there's a lot of story in, in their interview, and, and he talks about telling your story, that he will just pause it and very frankly and, and honestly look at the person and say, right now, you are not showing us these things that we are looking for. And 
if that means this job isn't for you, then that's okay. We'll shake hands and, and you know, you can go about your day. And if you want to walk out the door and come back in, we can restart. And he said that he has had people walk out the door and it's like this whole new confidence comes in and you see them open up. He said it, there are times that it, it doesn't work either. Uh, but I, I was just floored by that because I think my tendency would be to be like, this person is not giving me what I want. I am done with this. And I am really impressed with that idea. And I think it's an interesting tool to consider integrating into your interview process um, and, and thinking about what, what would that look like? What are the, the steps that would trigger that action? It was amazing to hear. And I went to Dan's session in San Diego and um, he talked about the mentoring mindset there and he's just got a lot of stuff to share. I think there's a, a masterclass sprint coming up at some point with, um, with him and it, it was awesome to listen to. I don't listen to a lot of camp code, but I should. That's all right, we'll forgive you this time. But I'm glad you tuned into that episode and liked it because ah, I had a great conversation with him. And so yeah, episode 63, check it out. And I met Dan years ago when I was in North Carolina staying at Ruby's and touring camps. And uh, yeah, good, really good stuff really good stuff. And, and I think that that's because there's oftentimes where as a camp person, and I'm sure Dan and Travis, and when you've interviewed en enough people, like within the first two minutes, if not 30 seconds, you can be like, mm. and you don't do that to them. But I wonder if some people, if you, some people are not going to come up to the challenge, right? They're not going to rise, but to give them that ability to be like, Hey, listen, here, let's, Let's back out. Do you want to start over again and just start different? I think there's a, there's a power because it shows that it shows that we have high expectations and it shows that we're, we care that they meet them. Right. So essentially what, what Dan is saying, like if someone buys into the system where, where we invite them to leave and restart an interview, I think that's the kind of people we want. We want them to step up to the challenge because I'm certain there's times, many times where I've interviewed someone and, and I'm like, they're not quite there, but they're going to be awesome when they get there. Um, and this is just a way to help them through that. If, if you were to look at like our industry and what we do and the chief skill we want our staff to have, it really comes down to mentoring, right? Like they could... And I don't know, I'm not going to trivialize our, our jobs, but like, you know, like, and most people could teach archery, most people could teach sports, most people could teach crafts. There is obviously specialized knowledge we need for higher level crafts. But when you really look at what the real skill is in what we do, and camp counselor is counseling and counseling is mentoring. And that's all people want. And if you, if you have um, supervisors mentoring their staff the right way, and staff mentoring their kids the right way, you're going to run a great camp. And all that is free. doesn't need a glitzy slide or an amazing property or uh, years of experience doing this. The mentoring is literally the, as simple as spending time with people. And it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. Like, if you look at um, Tina Bryson's new book, The Power of Showing Up, I'm, I'm listening to it right now. It's awesome. But it's like, we're at a point in society right now where we have to tell people to show up. <laughs> like, it, like, it's like, you know, that's, that's really the best way of having expectations is showing up and mentoring. I mean, it just, yeah, sorry, sorry for a rant, but I just like, it, it's just this common theme that pulls us all together. Well, Dan, Dan from Rockmont spoke about mentoring and the thing that got me the most is he, he said, you, you should not be a mentor to your direct reports. Because a mentor in his mindset, so we can be a great supervisor okay, and mentor, yeah, yeah. mentor people through supervision, but a true mentor calls people out all the time. Um, Dan had, Dan's, he said it much better than I just said it, but the idea is that when you're an employer, you're not always going to be a mentor and you don't want to confuse the two things. Because sometimes when you're an employer, you just have to say to them, you need to do this now. And that's not the mentor mindset. That's the you have a job, get it done, right? Like, yeah. because what happens when, when some, if you have a mentor or are a mentee, what happens when you don't show up is a lot of times your mentor is like, well, if you're not showing up for, and for my time, then I'm just, then I'm not, 
right? Like my job isn't to call you out. My job is to call you out that you didn't show up. But if you keep not showing up, I'm not going to waste my time being your mentor. Whereas as an employer, I have to continually spend time, right? If I haven't set the expectations correctly. And so Dan had a list of expectations for being a mentor, but he was very clear that it's a dangerous word to use when you're talking about a supervisor because a supervisor is going to act like a mentor, but not a true mentor in, in the sense of a life people pay for mentors. They're called life coaches, right? Like they're, they're, they, they are what they are, but uh, it was an interesting take. And it's all about that expectation because if you're going to be a mentee, you want someone who, who can ask the hard questions and say the hard things. Whereas when you're an, when you're an employer, you don't, you can't always say the hard things that they need to hear in that moment. So it's, it's a fine balance, but that comes down to expectations yet again, right? So what we expect of our counselors and of our supervisors um, and how much time they spend doing what they do. I, I think the, I like the, the middle of the line on that thing that you, you, you get compliance as a supervisor if you are clear on your expectations and are willing to um, be more than just, and I know this is not what you're saying, Joe, but just to take it to the extreme, more than just the do this, do that person, um, you get more compliance at its basic level, but more buy-in to the, to the mission of things if you are able to provide time and support and make those people, people feel noticed and appreciated, which I think is part of what Dan was saying too. Yeah, yeah, and I th yeah. and I think the clear just for a second, Dan. I think the clear differentiation, Travis, is that when you're a supervisor and an employer, when you set those clear expectations, the most powerful um, feeling that that you can use with your staff who are trying to live up to your expectations is disappointment. It's not anger. It's not right. It's literally like. I'm disappointed that you didn't meet that and here's how we're going to help you get there. Right. And so it's a, it's just that I, I agree. There's a middle road. Yeah. I really believe in the middle road. So uh, I, I would go to each of you to see if there's some wrap up thought. There's tons more we could talk about this. We've hardly touched on what it means to be at camp with these people and um, have those expectations, expectations be clear and to set the, high, the bar high. Um, I, I will wrap up with my, my wrap up thought first, which is that I think it's important to be honest with people. That's not new in this discussion, but I think it's okay to say we have high expectations. Um, in one of the big lessons of the um, the Alt MBA program from Seth Godin is this simple language, and you can't use it as a weapon. You have to be very careful with it. But um, you know that you're joining a group of people like you. That the language of people like us do things like this is powerful. That we see you as being one of our kind of people, and you know in these in these situations, people like us notice when others need help and they step in, or they ask if they you know like they're not assuming that. But all of those little things, like Scott Arizala often talks about noticing skills, and I think that's such a, an amazing part of being a supervisor. It is an amazing part of setting clear expectation, is seeing when things aren't clear to people, et cetera. So, um, so, so that's what I would say, is that you can say we have a high bar, and you can give people the tools to reach it. I have uh, two thoughts. Um, uh, first is uh, uh, the author of, um, of Quick and Nimble uh, t uh, has this phrase of when there's a void, our brains drift into negativity. So when you do not get in front of people regularly or you don't talk to people, so good. our brains drift into negativity. So, so let's role play for a second. I'm a staff member. I don't hear from my boss in a while. I think my, my boss doesn't like me, you know, like, and meanwhile, my boss is just busy. I'm a boss. I don't hear from my employee for a while. I think my employee's not doing any work or not, not meeting expectations. And uh, just, I don't no other way to say it, but shame on you if you're a supervisor and you're just waiting for your employee to come to you. You're, you're, you're wasting time. You're wasting 
their energy and you're wasting what you could get out of them. Just, you, you need to change your management style. And no news, uh, the, the idea that no news is good news, like if you don't hear from me as a, as a boss, then it's all good. Like I agree with yeah, you, yeah. you, like that's just a dick move as a supervisor. Yeah, and even, um, just, even just say, hey, I just want to let you know, I'm thinking of you, I have no update. That, you don't have to give them, you don't have to, you don't have to bend the knee, you just have to tell them, hey, that's it. So that's one, and the other is just role modeling. Um, uh, you know, like if you want your staff to go home at night, if you want your staff to be charged, if you want your staff to be balanced in life and you're not doing it, then they're going to follow you. Um, and that, yes. that's, that's really, a, you know, you hear about like Eastern uh, business practices in, in Japan about how like, you can't go home until your boss goes home and how bosses will work insane hours and it just becomes this perpetual cycle. Um, I, I'm of course like stereotyping, but this is the stories I hear. My brother-in-law lives in Japan and he talks about Japanese business ethics and, and the way of working. So I just, you have to role model. That's, that's, that's really it. So so um, Ruby, I wonder if you have any closing thoughts and I know that you have to go. So I want to publicly say, thank you so much for adding to this conversation. If you have a closing thought on this and then throw us your tool of the week and then we'll let you go off to have an awesome day. Yeah, totally. Uh, so just to follow up on Dan, I heard the phrase leaders leave loudly. I love alliteration too, so that's really satisfying. But that little phrase is one that I, I find myself repeating to camp leaders often, that it's important to say, and I'm leaving now, and to actually leave, because that signals to the rest of your staff, it's okay to leave too. But don't maybe use that during the summer, and don't use that when you're like leaving uh, for good. You don't want to leave loudly when you leave. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the, I, I just want to throw in a thought that I, I read in Wired Magazine about how there's um, some research and, and some tools being developed right now to uh, have some artificial intelligence and automation that's happening within your operating system to pick out tasks and then to insert those into your Facebook feed. And so that when somebody's scrolling through Facebook and they see um, their tasks come up, they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I can take care of that real quick. And there's this interesting like work-life integration thing going on. And that the research shows that for those little tasks, uh, people are more likely to get them done when they see them pop up in their social media feeds. So all that to be said, use your social media for content and expectation setting. So think about how you can share, you don't have to have a, a 10 page document pre-interview. I mean, yes, I think that's smart too, but take some of those pieces, put a photo with them, pop them on social media, and that's going to start bringing that stuff up. And you can put that on your general camp page. I, think, I mean, I may not put the pee poop vomit statement, but there are other ones you can put there, you know? Um, so definitely think about how you can use that tool because we're all looking for content. That's a, a great use of it. I'll throw in my tool of the week um, real quick because uh, as, as many folks know, I'm, I'm in Hawaii right now and I have adventures planned for today. Uh, so that's why I just give out a little bit early. But my tool of the week is an app that has been circulating among my friends I'm super excited about. It's called Peak Visor, V-I-S-O-R. And if you've ever used like the Nightwatch or Skywatch apps where you hold up the app and it shows you which stars you're looking at, it does the same thing for mountain tops. And so uh, I live up near the Blue Ridge Parkway in the, the Blue Ridge Mountains where I'm always like, oh, which mountain is that? And which mountain is that? And I love using maps and, and trying to figure it out, but to be able to just hold up my phone and confirm, I'm so excited about it. <laughs> so uh, if you need some nerdy orienteering fun, check out Peak Visor. Amazing. And thank you, Ruby, for being here. If people are interested in following Ruby, I would suggest you check out Ruby Outdoors on Instagram, where she's very active and puts awesome stuff. And if you want to get a hold of Ruby to follow up her with any questions, I would say reach out to Ruby at gocamp.pro. And um, there's lots of cool stuff there. Thanks, Ruby. Have an awesome day. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Joe, do you have any wrap-up thoughts on um, expectations? Yeah, I, I'm doing, I've done it three times now. My, I have a session I did at ACA National called Difficult Conversations and expectations is a huge part of that, right? It's, it's much easier to have difficult conversations with staff when they've gone beyond what you've helped them with, right? Once they're past the point of no return or they're just doing things that, the small things that you can't figure out why they're not listening to you. And I think that expectations solves a lot of our problems ahead of time. Uh, one of the things we set up at, at Pierce Williams is this idea that when you, we talk about 
um, our policies and procedures and, and the expectations, we talk a lot about choice, right? You make the choice to follow our policies. You make the choice to meet our expectations. And when you choose not to, you are also making a choice. And that makes it a lot easier for me to talk to people once they've gotten to the point where they're making a choice not to be a productive staff member or to add gossip and drama to camp or to just be a weight on camp as opposed to a positive thing. And so I think that expectations is a huge part and for especially for new camp directors who are younger, who are dealing with people who want constant feedback because they're getting constant feedback. And, but the, you can set the expectation on feedback as well, right? So if you set the expectation, you can ask staff what their expectation is, right? How do you wanna be talked to? How do you want me to bring you feedback? So you're setting clear expectations with them. But also to say, listen, it's, so for me specifically, it's not in my nature to give positive feedback five times a day or even five times a week, right? Like we're, and, and so if you need that, let's find someone who is also a supervisor of you and, and put them in place to, to help you. I can give you, I can give you lots of support, but it's, I also don't want to fake it. And so I think expectations is a huge topic that we can come back to time and time again if we, if we wanted to. I agree. I agree. I will say um, that I said that I had a wrap-up thought, and now I have a second wrap-up thought. Um, one of the things I've been pondering for the last two years, just in terms of big picture camp things, fits into this. And this is the idea that as a camp professional, I am always teaching. And some of you may have seen the stickers that I give out with IAAT on them. And um, it, it's just, I think it's the grand unified theory of leadership. Therefore, the grand unified theory of summer camp is that even if you are not being intentional about what you're doing in front of others, you're still teaching them things. And so that as, a, as part of the expectation is you have to, to fully digest that if you're awake, you're teaching people something whether it is teaching people how to wake up others in the morning with kindness and patience, or it is teaching people how to get off the bus quickly and efficiently. Um, you know, you can be teaching negatively or positively and you need to be thinking about how to do that positively. So that's, that I think is a, is a huge part of the, what makes a good camp professional is this idea that you fully take in, fully digest. I am always teaching whether or not I'm being intentional about that at this moment. So uh, I'd love to leave you with that thought. Dan, uh, why don't you start us off with your tool of the week? Well, why don't you follow up Ruby's tool of the week from a couple of minutes ago with your tool of the week, please. Yeah, uh, mine's a book. Um, it's The Coffee Bean by John Gordon. Um, it's a quick read. Um, it's, uh, I read it an hour. I like woke up early before my family did and knocked it out real quick. Um, but it, yeah, it's good. Um, it's just about overcoming challenges. It's a parable. So it's written in a story format, but um, I think it's good for anyone that's going through transition. I think it's good for anyone that might be joining your camp for the first time that has like a, a good history of working at other places or, or even for yourself if you need it. But just, yeah, highly recommend it. Amazing. Thank you. I know you also have to run, Dan. So what, yes. uh, how can people follow up with you if they have questions or et cetera? Yeah, they can find me at Dan Loves Camp online and at Instagram and Twitter, Dan Loves Camp as well, too. And I will see you at Tri-State. So that's the next public appearance. So yeah. Looking yeah. forward to that. I don't know if the show comes Great. out during Tri-State or after it, but, um, but okay. yes, for you and me and Ruby, be good to see you at Tri-State. <laughs> yes. Great. Thanks, man. Awesome. Later. Thank you. Take care. Take care. So, Joe, where can people follow up with you if they have questions? Can I do my tool of the week as well? Is oh, that my allowed? gosh. You should you know, totally just start saying. with your tool of the week and <laughs> then tell people. So, I have two tools this week because it's only the two of us uh, left. Um, the first tool, I am off tomorrow to fly to Belize to help build a micro house with a compressed earth block machine. Um, and this is a, a, a learning opportunity provided by Open Source Ecology out of uh, Missouri in the States. And if you don't know about Open Source Ecology, that's my tool of the week. They have a ton of open source machines that you can uh, build. Um, and camp seems like the perfect application for some of these things. They also have a summer program for this summer, the summer 2020, called the Summer of Extreme Design Build. 
And just to, to whet your interest, um, in June, they're building 3D printers and a CNC torch table and a CNC router and CNC mill, plastic shredders and filament makers. They're building them. You're not buying them. You're, not, you're building them from scratch parts. Um, in July, they're, uh, building mach they're building tractors, bulldozers, trenchers, backhoes, and augers, and a compressed earth block press. So it amazing. is, yeah, it's amazing. And then on August, they're doing uh, micro houses and aquaponic systems. It is, this is a treasure trove of information. If you're, I find a lot of camp people are interested in environmental and sustainability, and this is it. Um, I, as you may or may not know, always look for what's the future of camping, and this is why I'm traveling to Belize. Uh, my second tool, uh, the bonus tool, is, uh, I, is I put a link in the show notes to sign up for the Keen Footwear Pro program. Um, I believe my link goes to the Canada site, but uh, it might take you to uh, the American one as well. But anybody who's in camping can literally sign up and get, as according to the Keen people at the exhibit hall I was at, 50% off of all product. Um, yeah. So I have I would, my eye on a pair of Keen shoes. That's good well, to know. And, and as, a, as a large guy who has some toe uh, problems, the Keen footbed is much better for me. Um, and Chaco's doesn't do Canada. So right. um, Keen sandals are super awesome because they do have that closed toed in front. Um, right. And so those are my two tools of the week. Those are brilliant. And... If you want to follow up with me, Travis, just Thanks, you, Joe. if you want to follow up with me, uh, you can reach me at, you can find me on two different websites. So campisbetter.com is Pierce Williams and all Pierce Williams things. And yoyojo.com, Y-O-Y-O-J-O-E is where I tend to live the rest of my life. Um, right. Great. All of Joe's other awesome hobbies and interests <laughs> are shared at Yo Yo Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. My tool of the week is, um, is a podcast episode. Again, go to camphacker.tv slash podcast and look for the podcast episode on expectations um, to find the show notes and links to all these things. Awesome tools this week. Um, mine is a podcast episode when Brene Brown was on the Tim Ferriss podcast. And the first hour of it was interesting. And some people might be thinking there's more than an hour of a podcast. Tim tends to do long podcasts and it takes me two or three sessions to listen to them, but they're so great. Um, Brene Brown at about the hour mark on the session talked about parenting, setting expectations, following the theme, setting expectations with your kids and with your partner about parenting, and also some great stuff um, about her relationship with her husband, Steve, and I think so applicable for us, many of us who, are, who have partners who are not camp directors, and if they didn't, if you didn't meet at camp and get married at camp, then they might have some hard time with the expectation of what your life is. And so some good communication tools in there for um, setting time to prioritize your family and prioritizing the relationships and just going through stuff. That she's a great bit of language that I love her and her husband share about who has the energy to deal with the problems right now. Um, you know, you can come home from work and have been dealing with problems all day and you can say, I'm only at 25%. And she says her goal between her and her husband is to be at 100% total between the two of them. And so some people know that, you know, you have to step up. This is one of the great joys of co-directing with Beth is that we could say, I can't do this one right now. Can you please do this one? Um, so it's just great, good, good to give you language on that. So that's Brene Brown on the Tim Ferriss podcast. I encourage you to check that out. So thank you all for listening and watching. Um, fun if you watch this on YouTube to see Dan's mobile office and uh, and Ruby at her Airbnb in uh, in Hawaii. But we're grateful to seeing that. If you like the show and are watching it on YouTube, we would be super grateful if you would subscribe and hit the thumbs up button. That just helps us to share this with more Camp Pro. So we're super grateful about that. And I would say also, if you rate and review this show on whatever app that you're listening to, also helpful. Um, and we want to say a huge thanks to our Patreons at patreon.com. They are the camp pros who have supported the show, who pay for Matt to write up good show notes, et cetera. And you folks make this 
a possible and what a joy for us to get to do this. So thank you for that. So again, campacker.tv slash podcast, where you can find all sorts of things. Thanks for the evening, friends. Mm -hmm.